Um, so let me see if everyone is on mute except you, Arash. Okay, we are good. So please, the stage is yours. Thanks, thanks, Arash. Okay. Cool. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, let, let, let me first of all start by uh, saying a big thank you and congratulations to Antimo and the rest of the organizing team for putting together such a wonderful uh, school this week and also a really wonderful uh, developers workshop next week, which I'm really looking forward to being there in person. Um, so thank you Antimo and the team. It's, it, it looks absolutely fantastic. Um, so, uh, even though I'm not there with you in person, I'm with you, uh, I'm there with you in spirit. I have my uh, ICTP uh, mug uh, from which I'm drinking my tea, um, but I, I really wish I was there uh, to join you for this. I'm, I'm going to give you uh, a short talk uh, which really serves as an introduction to uh, the hands-on workshop uh, later this afternoon. So, I'll, I'll give the first part, which is sort of a broader introduction, and then Jonathan Yates uh, we'll give uh, uh, the second part with, with more details of how to actually run a Vanier 90 calculation. Uh, so my part should take about 20, 25 minutes and then, and then Jonathan will speak after that. Uh, so I'll start by first uh, saying uh, thank you to uh, my co-developers uh, of, the, of the Vanier code. Um, here they are. Uh, but actually, as I'll explain a bit later, uh, we now have a global community of uh, contributors to the Vanier 90 code. Uh, and this has been a really wonderful uh, move that we've made over the, uh, well, it was about six years ago now. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's resulted in uh, a, a real injection of, of vitality and activity in the development of uh, the code and the surrounding ecosystem of codes. Um, for those of you who are relatively uh, new, um, the website www.vanier.org uh, has a lot of uh, information that will be useful to you, and I encourage you to have a have a look at that. So the first thing you see here on the front page is uh, uh, the announcement of the summer school. This is where we're all at. Um, if I go to the download tab. This is where you can download the latest stable release of the code, which is version 3.1. It's the version that we'll be using uh, in the tutorials uh, later. Um, this was released uh, in March 2020. So you can, you can download it there um, if you need to, to, to run it on your own machine. Of course, for the, for the tutorial this afternoon, it's already installed on the virtual machine. Um, and there's a link to the GitHub site um, where the code repository sits for those who want to uh, get more involved in uh, developing and contributing to the code. If uh, you go to the support tab, um, this is where you can find uh, the user guide and the tutorial uh, set. Um, and also thanks to Valerio uh, Vitale, who I, I believe is in the audience, um, uh, he's written a booklet of all the solutions to the, to the set of tutorials, um, which, which is very useful for when you're going through it. Uh, so again, this is, a, this is a useful resource. And then down here, under community email forum, you can subscribe to the mailing list where, you know, the whole community uh, can answer questions that you have uh, about the code if something's not working, uh, if you don't know how to do something. Uh, there's a very supportive community out there who uh, will probably know the answer to your question. Uh, finally, um, if you uh, write a paper that arises from using uh, Vanier 90, please do cite uh, the relevant uh, paper. So. Uh, this paper here at the top, um, if it's uh, version three or later, or uh, these paper, this paper down here, if it's an earlier version, um, because you know th this this is a really great way of giving recognition uh, to all these people who have been contributing and working hard to make sure the code is robust and works really well. So uh, that would be that would be really great. Right. So as uh, Nicola mentioned. Uh, uh, in his excellent talk uh, this morning, and also Rafaela uh, in the talk before. Um, Vanier functions uh, are used to give a, a localized and real space 
uh, intuitive picture of chemical bonding in materials and molecules. Um, and they have, uh, they have links to the modern theory of polarization and orbital magnetization. Uh, you can use them as a minimal basis to do efficient uh, interpolation to calculate transport properties and topological properties and, and very phase properties. So uh, they're, they're extremely uh, useful and uh, they, uh, these days they, they sort of form part of the standard toolkit uh, of the electronic structure theorist uh, who is looking at solving and understanding problems in, in materials and molecules. And uh, sort of an overview of how, how you go about doing this is you start from um, an electronic ground state uh, first principles calculation using your favorite, um, favorite code. It could be quantum espresso or VASP or Abinit, sort of a plane wave pseudo-potential density functional theory code, or it could be something else. It doesn't have to be that. Um, and you get your eigenstates and eigenvalues. And from those, um, you... Uh, if, if, you, if you need to, you can select a subspace of, of, of states, usually by defining energy windows uh, in, your, in your band structure. And uh, you conduct this unitary transformation, which Nicola talked about earlier this morning, in order to rotate the basis to obtain these maximally localized Vanier functions. Uh, these unitary transformations are um, arbitrary, um, and uh, you choose uh, the, the U matrix, which minimizes uh, the, the, the total spread of the set of Vanier functions that, you're, that you want to obtain. Okay, so that's how you, that's how you uh, break the, the, um, uh, the degeneracy, if you like, in, in how to choose uh, the, the, the unitary, uh, the elements of the unitary matrix. Um, and so that's what the code uh, effectively does. Um, it does it in a, in a discretized space. Uh, so, uh, of course, we, we, we always discretize our Broluan zone into a set of uh, K points, a mesh of K points. And the key quantities uh, that you need in order to conduct this uh, subspace selection and unitary transformation are the overlaps of the periodic parts of the block states, uh, these UMKs, um, on neighboring K points. So uh, the vector B is a vector that takes you from uh, a K point K to its neighbor uh, K plus B. Uh, and so you get the uh, first principles code to calculate these overlaps. Um, and Vanier 90 reads those overlaps and from those is able to do this. The other ingredient that Vanier 90 needs is um, an initial guess for uh, this uh, U matrix to start off the optimization procedure of uh, the total spread. Um, and uh, usually what you would do is you would construct that initial guess by making an initial guess for the Vanier functions themselves. Uh, we call these uh, projections. Uh, these uh, G of R's, these are usually localized uh, functions that you choose the, the shape and location of. Uh, in, in Vanier 90, uh, you, can, you can choose from S orbitals, P orbitals, D orbitals, F orbitals, and a bunch of uh, defined hybrid type orbitals. Uh, and you put these where, where you think your Vanier functions will be, um, and you project uh, the Bloch eigenstates onto those um, projection functions to generate uh, a matrix, which is which we call A. Um, and again, this is something that's calculated uh, as part of the uh, ab initio code. It's something that the ab initio code typically uh, does for you. And again, Vanier 90 reads that matrix in and from that constructs this uh, initial guess for the unitary transformations. More recently, and there'll be a, there'll be a session on this um, later in the week, uh, you can use the selected columns of the density matrix approach in order to um, uh, circumvent this requirement to uh, explicitly specify an initial guess for the projections 
Um, and this is particularly useful when you're doing high throughput calculations where you know you can't really by hand manually go and, and, and choose the um, the initial guess for every system that you want to that you want to study. So that, that's something you'll hear about uh, later in the week. Okay, so Vanier 90, once it's armed with with these uh, with these matrices um, and, uh, and 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 you know the eigenvalues of the block eigenstates, it can go away and minimize the spread uh, and calculate the Vanier functions in field space. So from the from the very beginning, uh, when we when we started to think about uh, designing and developing uh, Vanier ninety, um, uh, we wanted it to be modular. We wanted it to be written in uh, Fortran. Um, back then, you know, it, Fortran was really the, the, the clearest choice of programming language uh, for numerical methods. Um, we wanted it to be very well documented and commented because, e e you know, even back then we had this idea that, you know, we hoped that the, the code that we were developing uh, for our own research would actually also be useful for other people. Um, uh, it's open source under the version two of the uh, GNU public license. And uh, it's, it's always been under uh, a version control repository. Um, these days it's GitHub and I'll, I'll describe that a little bit later. Um, and sort of two sort of overarching um, uh, ideas that we had was that we wanted it really to be as easy as possible for someone um, someone else to come to the code and add new functionality. Um, so, you know, that was what was driving a lot of these, uh, these uh, decisions uh, up here in black. And uh, we wanted uh, it to be very easy to interface any first principles electronic structure code to Vanier 90. Um, and for this reason, we sort of took the explicit decision not to include any information, for Vanier 90 not to require any information about the underlying basis set or the FFT grid that the electronic structure code uh, uses. Uh, we only require the matrix elements, uh, so the, 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 the scalar quantities um, that you calculate uh, from the eigenstates, which are represented in some basis set. Okay, so, so those were sort of very clear uh, upfront design decisions that, uh, that, that we made. And I think, you know, I think those were good decisions in the end, um, because as we can see now, uh, there is this uh, very vibrant ecosystem of uh, first principles electronic structure codes that um, are interfaced to Vanier 90. So Vanier 90 can, can read input essentially from all of these codes down here with the red arrows at the bottom, which really do represent the vast majority of, of, of first principles electronic structure codes in, in our field. Um, so essentially anyone in our community um, has access to the functionality of Vanier 90 through, through these codes. Um, and then this uh, second ecosystem of codes that use uh, the results of Vanier 90 to then do all sorts of other wonderful things, uh, many of which you will see uh, as part of as part of this school. So electron phonon coupling, um, you'll see uh, berry properties, um, you'll see, uh, and so forth. So it really is a very vibrant and large uh, community and ecosystem of methods and and codes. Uh, so it's, it's really wonderful to see this. Um, in the early days, uh, the development model of Vanier 90 was, was, very, uh, was very simple. Uh, there was a, uh, a small Vanier developers group um, and you know, we would make all the, all the changes and push them to the main, to the main code. And uh, essentially we were, we, it, it, this, this was it, there was a handful of, handful of people. And I, I think I have a photo, yeah, I have a photo of the very first Vanier 90 developers meeting. So this is uh, Jonathan Yates and me in San Francisco in March 2006. Um, as Nicola mentioned earlier, Jonathan was a postdoc with Ivo Souza uh, in Berkeley. I was a postdoc with Nicola at MIT. And uh, Jonathan and I uh, got together and, and took the codes actually that Nicola and Ivo and David 
um, had written uh, in Fortran 77 as part of their earlier work. And we started thinking about um, making something that was uh, easily interfaceable to other codes and, and something that was made perhaps just a little bit more user user friendly. So I went over to San Francisco and we sort of, this, this is really the, uh, the, the first uh, Vanier, 90, Vanier 90 developer meeting. And this is the, the picture of the blackboard, probably at some point um, in the middle of the week uh, when we were, were breaking the back of this. Uh, things have moved on since then. Um, and uh, we now have this uh, global community of Vanier contributors. The Vanier code is now publicly uh, hosted on GitHub, um, where uh, anyone can, can um, contribute uh, code to it. And so the model now is that we have this global community who uh, develop uh, code, make pull requests, which, you know, still there's a, there's a relatively small group of people that sort of vet those pull requests, make sure that they conform to the style that, that, that we require in the code, make sure that things, things are working uh, correctly, that the structure is, is okay and compatible with what we have. Uh, but then those, those developments from the community get merged into the, into the main code. And this really happened in uh, September 2016, uh, or in the run-up to September 2016, when we had this, this first uh, community developers workshop in San Sebastian, which was uh, hosted by Ivo, Ivo Souza. Um, and uh, uh, this event led to a number of new developments. It led to version three of, of the code, which was, which was uh, released shortly after that meeting, uh, well, a few years after that meeting, and this paper with um, uh, uh, the full list of contributors uh, to, to, to that code. Um, so, so this was a really great uh, thing that happened. Um, the, the current distribution uh, is um, 172 megabytes. Uh, the majority of that is really just examples and uh, the test suite. Uh, so this is the, the suite of um, uh, examples that the code is tested on to make sure that any changes that are made to it uh, don't break anything. Uh, the source code itself is, is relatively small. It's only 1.6 megabytes of, of, this, uh, of, of this distribution. Um, uh, and it consists of about 40,000 lines of code, including, including all the comments. So it's, a, it's still a relatively compact um, code, which, which again, for those of you who are who are thinking of, of making contributions and, and, and developments, you know, it's, it's, it's a fairly easy code to, to become familiar with. Um, the, the code is actually consists of, it actually consists of two parts. Um, there's the main Vanier 90 executable, uh, which uh, you can run in either serial or parallel, which does um, the, core job of minimizing the spread. And uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, you can do some the plotting of the Vanier functions themselves, a little uh, bit of band interpolation and Fermi surface plotting. You can, it can print out the real space Hamiltonian for you and it does quantum transport. Um, and then there's a, uh, a second executable post Vanier 90.x, uh, which is also serial or parallel, um, and all the other properties, um, uh, including a reproduction of some of these. So it also does band interpolation and Fermi surface plotting um, and, and uh, uh, the Hamiltonian. Um, all the other properties are within this post Vanier 90 uh, code. And so the idea is uh, that, you know, you would use Vanier 90 to generate the Vanier functions and then you would use post Vanier 90 as a separate step in order to calculate properties from those Vanier functions. Um, and all you need are a Fortran compiler, uh, some linear algebra libraries, just the basic linear algebra libraries, MPI if you want to run in parallel, and uh, uh, GNU make to, to compile the code. Um, and here's a list of, uh, of uh, the, um, the 
user features, the, 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 the things that you can do you can do with it. Many of these, I won't, I won't go through all of them, uh, but many of these you will see in um, later parts of uh, this school, and you'll actually get your, uh, be able to get your hands, uh, uh, hands on calculating a lot of these properties uh, as, as you go through the school. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly just uh, skip, skip through that. Um, but you can see it's already, it's already quite extensive, and this is not including uh, the ecosystem of codes that then take the results of Vanier 90 and then do further things with them. So that all that stuff is on top. Um, and then if you're thinking of, of, of developing uh, code for Vanier 90, then uh, here's, some, here's some information that uh, might be of interest to you. So as I've said, it's um, uh, under GitHub and we, we operate a, a fork and pull request model, which means, uh, you know, you should fork the code into your own uh, repository, make your changes there, and then um, do a pull request into the, into the develop branch, which will then be checked. Um, we have a, a suite of, of tests, which you know, check the veracity of the code, um, both for uh, pull requests and also sort of regularly, uh, just to check that things are, things are working okay. Um, the continuous integration is done within GitHub Actions. Uh, it used to be Travis CI, but, but we changed that relatively recently. If, if, if a commit uh, doesn't pass the tests, then um, uh, it's blocked and it needs to be fixed. Um, and you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a few other things uh, that might be of interest to, to developers, uh, which I just mentioned there. Um, one thing that uh, is a, a fairly major change that will be coming soon um, is this distinction between what we call the standalone mode and, and the library mode. And this is the last thing I'll mention in, in the talk before passing to Jonathan. Um, so standalone mode is probably the mode that most people uh, use uh, Vanier 90 in. So, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially, uh, you, you treat the electronic structure code or the uh, post-processing code uh, as an external program and, and, and uh, Vanier 90 as an external program. So the, the two programs are, are sort of separate, the two codes are separate and they talk to each other um, by reading and writing files to disk. So let's say, you know, this external program is Quantum Espresso um, and Vanier 90 needs to, needs to tell Quantum Espresso what overlaps between the block states to calculate. Vanier 90 will write a file to disk. Quantum Espresso will read that file, calculate the overlaps, write them to file again, and then Vanier 90 will read those overlaps in again. Okay, so this is what we refer to as standalone mode. So all the communication is done via files written to disk. Um, there is also a, um, Ah, so, and, and this, this is sort of in detail how that, how that works. Um, I, I'll just skip that uh, for now. Um, there is also a library mode where um, the external program uh, calls Vanier 90 from, from within itself. So uh, there are, in particular, at the moment, there are these two uh, library calls that you can compile uh, within Vanier 90 and then use them uh, within your external program to call, uh, to call uh, the functionality of, of, of Vanier 90. So this first uh, library call will do the setup. So it will tell your program, for example, uh, which overlaps it needs to calculate and all the things that Vanier needs, Vanier 90 needs to, to, to generate the Vanier functions. And then you call Vanier run um, to actually calculate, you know, whatever properties you require. Now, the, um, the current version of the library is quite rudimentary in the sense that it's uh, serial only, and uh, it, 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 only, um, it only has a subset of the full functionality of, of, of the full code. In particular, it really only does the core disentanglement and vanierization. Uh, nothing else really. Um, and this library mode hasn't really changed uh, for, for, for many, many years, re really since when it was first um, implemented uh, at the very beginning. Um, we're currently uh, 
undergoing a major effort, uh, which is funded uh, by um, uh, the UK's Engineering and Physical Researchers uh, uh, um, Council, Physical Science Council, and the UK CCP9 network, which is sort of the UK's internal uh, electronic structure network, um, to, to really transform Vanier 90's library mode such that it incorporates all of the functionality of the code. And, and in fact, uh, Vanier 90, the program itself, really just becomes a wrapper calling its own library. So that's, that's the aim. And the idea behind this is that um, you know, it will enable external codes full access to Vanier 90's functionality by calling uh, the library from within themselves. And you know, this has lots of advantages because it will enable uh, you know, Vanier functions to be, to be accessed, for example, during a self-consistent field cycle in an electronic structure simulation. Say at each iteration, you can monitor, say, the polarization of uh, your box of water molecules we were talking about earlier. Let's say you're doing a dynamical simulation of that. And, you know, if you can call it from within the code uh, without having to go to an external uh, call of Vanier 90, you can monitor these things on the fly. You can run multiple instances of Vanier 90 simultaneously from within your code with different input parameters, for example. So there are many advantages to, 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 to doing this. And so we're now progressing uh, towards, towards that goal. There's already, already been quite a lot of progress over the past uh, 12 or 18 months for those of you who've been following it. Um, and uh, you know we, we're getting closer to it, and it's going to be one of the major topics of discussion in next week's developer meeting as well. So I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd mention one, this as one of the main main upcoming developments uh, from our side. Right, I think uh, I'll finish there. Um, and uh, I don't know whether and Timo, you want to do questions now or do questions after Jonathan's talk for both of us. I think we, we, we can do, we can take questions now while uh, Jonathan uh, prepares, set up uh, all the, um, his presentation essentially. So if, let me just see if J Jonathan is connected. Yeah, okay, yeah. Mute. So in the meantime, do you have any questions here in presence? Raise your hand. Okay, are there any questions on Zoom? Write in the chat or, uh, or raise your hand uh, virtually, let's say. Okay, so maybe I have a question. Um, so, Rash, can you hear me? I can, yes. So. so how do you, so uh, th this looks like a major change, you know, going from a code that is supposed to be mostly standalone to, uh, you know, something that is mostly a library and then, and then the code, so, so the, you use it, um, as, as you said, you, you just write a wrapper. So how do you plan the transition for, for the users? How, how, how is it going to work? Uh, if you, uh, is, it, is it going to be like a version 4.0 where uh, all of a sudden everything is encapsulated as a wrapper or... Um, yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I'm hoping that for, for, for users that will use it as a, who use Vanier 90 as a standalone program and will continue to use it as a standalone program, um, the impact should be minimal. Um, for developers, uh, obviously a lot has already changed and a lot will change internally. Um, and so people who are, uh, developing contributions um, uh, need to be mindful of the changes that we're doing. And in fact, you know, I, I didn't mention it, but, but we've been doing these developments hand in hand with the community. So there's been, uh, you know, even before we started, there was a huge amount of community engagement with the developer community. Um, uh, we wrote to all of the developers of, of, of codes within the ecosystem, uh, asked their opinions of what they thought um, uh, about moving to a library. Um, how, you know, what are the main features that we should make sure that we have. So it's, it's, it's all been done hand in hand. We have a wiki page on GitHub, which is sort of explaining the stages that we're doing in the development and the timeline for those stages so that people are 
um, are aware. So, so we're very, very aware of the impact on the developer community. And, you know, this is why it's going to be one of the, you know, big topic of discussion next week, I think, um, to just make sure that, that we're bringing people along with us um, and, and not causing too many headaches. Um, but yes, that, you know, there obviously will be a few, few teething problems uh, in the transition, I think, in particular for, for developers. But I think the, the, the place we're going to end up at afterwards will be a better place. I th so I think it's going, going to be worth, um, uh, worth the effort. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for, for the clarification. So I see there is a question from Stepan. Hold on a second that I bring the microphone to him. Hello, Arash. Uh, my question is, uh, all these changes uh, in the library mode, uh, are they only for one year 90 itself or also country, uh, including post W90? Uh, yeah, so, so, there'll be, so the idea is that it will be post W90 as well. Uh, the stage we're at now is, is we actually need to think, um, think about how to structure the library call. So, so you know, it's not going to be one monolithic library call. Um, we, need to, we need to think about, you know, what, what are the library calls going to be? How are we going to divide that up? Um, and so, you know, this is, I hope, one of the things that we're going to discuss uh, next week in, in, in detail. Okay, so if there are no uh, any other questions, I think we can thank Arash for a great talk. I move to the second part. Uh, so we have <clears throat> Jonathan Yates, and who will be speaking about Vanier 90, a brief overview of the code. So the floor is yours, Arash. Um, Jonathan, please. Hi, thank you, Antimo. Uh, can just check that you can hear me okay? Absolutely, loud and clear. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, so, yeah, th thank you to the organisers. Obviously, I uh, can't be in, uh, in, in Trieste at the moment. I'm still in the UK. I'm looking forward to coming to, uh, to Trieste for the developer week next week. Um, so, uh, in the remaining time uh, before lunch, um, it falls to me to talk a little bit about the practicalities of running Vanier 90. That's a little bit of a weird thing because really, you know, the way to get used to running a code is to dive in and run the code. But this afternoon, there'll be, there'll be the opportunity to do that. We've got some fairly in-depth uh, tutorials to guide you through. There are lots of people to, that you can talk to and ask questions. And I spent part of the weekend making a series of YouTube videos uh, where I go through some of the um, uh, some of the examples and talk about the science and the interpretation uh, that what, what you might find out from it. But um, perhaps it's useful uh, as a bit of a taster just to give you some of the principles of, of how Vanier 90 operates. Okay. So what are we going to take uh, as the input? So um, uh, as Arash mentioned, we need sort of three inputs into the into uh, into the Vanier 90 calculation. Um, they might have been generated, for example, from, from Quantum Expresso, but they could have come from any of these electronic structure codes that interface. So what have we got? We've got the, uh, the M matrix, okay, M, MN, which would be the overlap um, UMK, UNK plus B. So these are the overlaps between um, block states at a K point and at the kind of nearest neighbor uh, K points. We'd have some projections. So this is the A matrix, A, M, N, and this would be, so G of M projected onto U, N, K, okay? Um, and then we'd have the eig file, which is the eigenvalues, okay? So those are the inputs for doing your basic vanierization, vanier calculation, okay? To control vanier 90, we would have the win file, the vanier input file, um, and we use the concept of a seed name. So, for example, um, here you see that all the, pro, all the files here have silicon as their seed name. So we're going to use that to, to that's the, what we would pass to Vanier 90, and it would know how to, uh, which files to read. Okay. So a little bit more on the input file. So the Vanier 90 input file is rather flexible. Um, you can have some comments, so all these different ways, um, choose your favorite way of having a comment. 
Um, if you need to set a keyword, you can do it in a number of different ways. Okay. Um, a useful one to know about is the iPrint, so the level of verbosity that gets written out in the output file. So iPrint 1 is the normal level, and if you'd like to see lots more information, um, you can increase that. For example, iPrint 3 is the full debug level. Okay. So Vanier 90 has lots of different uh, keywords. You don't have to specify all of them. By default, Vanier will choose good defaults uh, for most of the keywords. There are just a few that you actually have to specify. So we do need to tell it what the system is. Okay, so here's an um, input for silicon, for example, with my, uh, with my two atoms for silicon. And here I've given the, uh, the unit cell in Cartesians. And um, the default unit for Vanier 90 is angstrom, but if you like Bohr, you can just tell it to use Bohr instead. So that is okay. Um, as various of the uh, speakers earlier have talked about, um, it's very helpful for Vanier to have an initial projection onto some local orbitals. So we have a quite flexible way of specifying these projections. So for example, this is for the, uh, the copper example that Nicola showed earlier, where you put D orbitals onto the copper. And then because we wanted F, um, some S orbitals at the interstitial sites, um, we've given the actual fractional coordinates of the locations of where we want those uh, S orbitals to be. This would be, for example, in silicon, if we wanted uh, to project onto sp3 orbitals. And, you know, if you don't want to use a projection at all, you can see what happens if you use the, uh, the just the block phases, so run without any projections. That's likely to lead to quite a long uh, minimization procedure, but in some cases it can be interesting. Okay. Um, controlling the minimization. So, We've got this distinction between when we're dealing with a, an isolated manifold of states, so for example, the valence bands in an in a insulator, and the more complicated case when we've got an entangled set of bands, for example, a metallic system. So let's just deal, first of all, with the straightforward case. So here I've got the, uh, the valence bands of silicon, and we need to tell Vanier, fun Vanier 90 a couple of things. We need to tell it how many Vanier functions we're expecting, so for silicon, four bands, four Vanier functions. Um, we also need to tell it how many iterations to run for. Now that's a little bit of a change from uh, if you're used to uh, electronic structure codes, you'd normally ask for, if you've got a minimization algorithm, you'd normally ask for um, some sort of tolerance on uh, the total energy convergence, for example. Um, with Vanier, for reasons I'll come into a second, instead we tend to specify the number of, um, uh, the number of iterations, okay. So, that's our inputs, the files we need to read. That's the, um, yeah, somebody's asked about random auto, okay, there are lots of um, more sophisticated ways to specify projections. There's some interesting talks coming later this week uh, uh, about more advanced ways of specifying projections. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll leave that for a little bit later. I'll just keep on with the simple uh, projections onto atomic orbitals, the more, the more old school way of doing things at the moment. Okay. Um, right, so we've got our input files, the MMN, the AMN, and the IG file, which have come from our ab initio code. We've got our Vanier input uh, code, and then, oh, there we go. That's nice to change. Um, here we have the, um, what would happen if, we, if you run Vanier 90. So this is part of the output of, of, of Vanier 90 and a lot of information on there, but uh, this is part of a minimization cycle. So this is the first cycle. So this is what happens um, in the first step. And then this is well, the initial step before we've minimized everything. And then in the second step, we've done a slightly different unitary transformation hopefully to make the spread a little bit more localized. Okay, and we've chosen that in this kind of conjugate gradient approach that Nicola referred to. Okay, so this is silicon. We've projected onto, um, in this particular case, we've projected onto atom-centered, um, sorry, bond-centered S orbitals. And we get um, the locations of the, each of these correspond to the four Vanier functions. We get the location of the Vanier function and its spread. Um, and if you looked at the crystallography of this, they're just distributed uh, on, on the bond centers. 
and to good numerical approximation, they all have the same, uh, the same value of the individual spread. So what have we got here? We've got the decomposition into the um, different, so this is the total spread here. And as Nicola mentioned, we can have an off diagonal and a diagonal contribution to the spread, okay? Um, and this is, this is the total spread, which is actually the thing that we're minimizing. And so we make this uh, um, new unitary uh, transformation and the spread decreases only very slightly, but there's a slight decrease in the spread. This is the, the, the first iteration. And that's we, the delta here is the change in the spread from one iteration to the next, okay? So this will then proceed through a number of different steps, however many we've asked it for. Here we go. So in this particular case, 100 cycles later, this is what we're finding, that the change in the spread now is really very small. Okay, these look like reasonably well converged. And Vanier 90 will now finish, plot out its final state, and it will now give you a report on the decomposition of the spread. Um, but again, the most interesting one is the total spread here. And just to note the time for this, which was 0.2 seconds, okay, it's sort of within the noise. This is an incredibly fast uh, calculation. It's dealing with, um, with silicon, so lots of four by four matrices. Okay. So why did we not specify a tolerance rather than the number of steps? Each step is really very quick. And um, we find that the minimization can sometimes uh, do things like a plateau. So it's not uncommon to see something like a minimization where it goes down, it plateaus, and then it goes down again. That will happen, for example, if you started with atomic states, you'd, you'd find you'll get yourself into a plateau like this, and then after a few steps, the minimization will drop down again and will we'll hybridize them into, say, sp3 orbitals or something like this. So um, our recommendation is actually to pick a, um, a number of steps and monitor how the, how the vanierization is going. Um, there's some quite sophisticated uh, restart facilities. So um, for example, you can set the, uh, it writes backups every few iterations. You can determine how many there are, how, how often they're written. So you can, for example, run Vanier 90, quit it, and then um, you could then restart and do all the plotting if you decided that Vanier 90 had actually finished and you didn't want to allow it to carry on with the number of iterations. Or equally, if you ran it for 100 iterations and decided it needed more iterations, you can uh, restart and, and carry on with the vanierization. So there's some good restart features in there. Okay. That's a, Oscar's got a really good question, um, which is about uh, how to avoid local minima. I think that that will be better handled a bit towards the end. I think that's because uh, that, that's a really interesting, important question. Okay, so that's about about the job control. Um, so to plot the Vanier functions, um, very straightforward. We have a, a Vanier. Uh, we can set Vanier plot is true. Um, the Vanier functions, for reasons I mentioned, mentioned in a moment, live within a supercell of the unit cell, so we have to decide how big a supercell to plot. And plotting the Vanier functions can be a little bit expensive, so we can actually plot a subset of them if we wanted to. For example, this would allow us to plot the three Vanier functions, numbers 1, 4, and 8. This version would allow us to plot the Vanier functions 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6. Okay. So, Reason to plot the Vanier functions, we get pretty pictures, which are good for including in talks like this one for silicon. Um, but there's something else that's very useful when we plot the Vanier functions, is that Vanier 90 will allow us to then look at how real the Vanier functions are. So here for silicon, we've plotted the maximum imaginary to real ratio, and you see that's really quite small. So what these, mean, what these means is to a good numerical precision, the Vanier, Vanier functions in silicon are indeed real. Just to note, here's the time it took to plot the Vanier functions, five seconds. To make the Vanier functions, 0.2 seconds. To plot them, five seconds. So plotting Vanier functions, way more expensive because we have to go back to a, some sort of basis. Okay. okay. So uh, we can also plot bands. Simple uh, logical to turn that on is the plot bands keyword. 
Um, we can set the number of points along each, each section, but then we specify the high symmetry directions. Okay, so this is something that you can obtain from material from materials cloud or seek path or one of those places that allows you to get hold of uh, a sensible path through 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 case space and so this will use the the the, the sort of vanier the hamiltonian in the vanier basis and the idea of vanier interpolation to very rapidly give you a a, a very um, detailed band structure okay okay so just to, to summarize there's a bit of a choreography of of uh of running Vanier and the ab initio code. So, um, and this can be sped up with things like AIDA and the things that you may hear about later, later on. But um, the standard way of running it would be, first of all, we run, we're going, this, is, this is an example for Quantum Expresso, which we're gonna use in the tutorial. So what we would do is, first of all, we run PW to get the ground state charge density. We then run Quantum Expresso again but now we want the block states on a uniform mesh of K points in the Brill 1 zone, okay? And that's gonna be a key parameter, whether we choose say 444 mesh of K points, but I'll come on to that in a second. We then run Vanier 90 with this so-called post uh, pre-processing flag here, the minus PP option. What that does is it analyzes the symmetry of the crystal, the K point mesh, and it decides what overlaps need to be calculated. So these overlaps between the, the, the block states at neighboring K points, it, it generates an exact list of what it needs, what Vanier 90 will need. And it also generates a list of what projections it needs. So then the code PW to Vanier 90, which is part of Quantum Expresso, will calculate those overlaps and projections for us. It will use the block states we, we got at this step with the instructions from this step. And this will generate the those matrices we needed, the M matrix, the A matrix, and it will generate the eigenvalues. Then, finally, we can run Vanier 90, okay? Just to say, if you want to run Vanier 90 in parallel, it's very easy, you just run it with MPI run, and it goes through like this, okay? Um, for the examples you're running this afternoon, they're all quite small, like silicon is a four by four, you know, you're dealing with four by four matrices. So the parallel performance will actually not be that great. Uh, the, the Vanier calculations themselves should be incredibly quick. Um, so I would probably just keep to the serial version. Um, just a little note about K point sampling. So in principle, um, when we form the Vanier functions, we should use this continuous integral over the Brewer one zone. A Vanier function then one Vanier function lives by itself in infinite space in the crystal. But in practice, we can't do that. We use a, we replace the integral with a sum and we do a sum over a finite number of, a finite grid of K points. And that has an implication for the periodicity of the Vanier functions. They're no longer completely isolated in space. They have periodic images, okay? So for example, if I sampled the Brouillon zone with a three by three by three sampling, uh, my Vanier functions would be periodic in a three by three in a in a three by three by three supercell of the unit cell. Okay, and the key thing is the finer the K point sampling, the greater the unit cell, the larger the unit cell that they live. So the further away are the periodic images. You can notice that sometimes when you do plotting because you might think, well, hang on, why am I why have I got I got an extra Vanier function over there? And what you're seeing is the periodic image. Um, but it also has an implication when you're doing sort of making a Vanier type binding model. Okay, you're looking at the Hamiltonian of the Vanier function because, you know, if you thought about um, in, in the infinite case, you could have the matrix elements between your Vanier function and any other Vanier function that you wanted. That would be nicely well defined. If you had fairly coarse sampling, you could certainly have first nearest neighbor interactions. You get the Hamiltonian between these two Vanier functions. But if you thought about second nearest neighbor interactions, well, that's a problem because that's the same as first nearest neighbor interactions, okay? The periodicity doesn't allow you to do that. But if you sample more finely in k-space and thus push the periodic images further apart, you can now have second nearest neighbor interactions as well as first nearest neighbor interactions, okay? What does that mean when you're looking, for, for example, at the band structures that come out uh, of, of Vanier 90? Well, here's an example of lead. I know it's a metal, but luckily lead has an isolated group of, of, of low-lying bands, so we can use the standard techniques that we've, we've uh, used so far, even though it is a metal. And so if we construct the Vanier functions using a four-cubed K-mesh, 
and we then look at the Vanier interpolated bands, you can see some differences. So the blue is the Vanier interpolated, the red is from QE, and you see that there are definitely some differences in there, um, sort of around here and around here. If we increase and we go to a much larger mesh, we've got more nearest neighbors in our type binding representation. And now by eye, you certainly can't see any difference. And we can make this more, um, uh, more numeric by, uh, by just ca calculating the average errors. And what you show, can show is that the, um, as you increase the K mesh, the accuracy of the Vanier interpolation increases exponentially. Okay, and that's related to the exponential decay of the Vanier functions. So one of the, so, so the main kind of um, uh, parameter that you're going to end up potentially changing to improve the quality of Vanier functions will be the k-point sampling that you use to construct those Vanier functions. Okay? But because of the exponential sampling, you'll never need to use uh, an enormous k-point grid. Okay, so my, the last thing to cover is what about a metal? Okay, what, when we have an entangled uh, set of bands, this is the, this is the, um, uh, the, the, the situation that Nicola discussed towards the end of his, the end of his talk. Um, so this is where we, for example, might have a, um, so we, here, this is the band structure of copper. We've got, there's no, um, no set of bands that are uh, distinct uh, from all the others. So if we wanted to extract out a Vanier basis to describe well, for example, uh, the, so the Fermi energy is in copper is about here. If we wanted to extract out um, a Vanier basis to describe these low-lying occupied states and perhaps just above the conduction band, we've got to find, find this method of, of extracting. So for example, we might have 12 um, uh, block states that came from our quantum encresto calculation, and we want to extract out uh, seven Vanier functions. So we use this method uh, that was uh, in, in introduced by Eva Sosa of um, minimizing the gauge invariant part of the spread. So extracting out what we call an opt optimally connected subspace. So we have some windows. We define, um, we can choose to define anyway an inner window. And we say, right, those states we're going to include, they're going to be as they are. Okay, we're not going to allow those states to, to to change, they're definitely going to be in our, our unitary transformation going from the 12 um, bands into the seven uh, Vanier functions, they're going to be in there. And then within this outer window, so these states here, we will allow some non-integer mixing of, of, of those, those states, and we will do that in a way that minimizes the gauge invariant spread. So in when we're dealing with metals, we also have to uh, supply uh, these windows as well as the number of bands and the number of Vanier functions. Okay, And this will be automatically turned on as soon as the number of bands isn't equal to the number of Vanier functions. Okay. The question about how do you know and how to choose which states is a really good one. Um, and I think the best way to answer this is to say there is a bit of trial and error involved in this. You certainly need to plot a band structure from the DFT code first. You need to think about the character of the states that are involved, and there is a little bit of trial and error. You'll see that Nicola mentioned some work, um, and Valerio will talk later in the week about methods to automate this process. But at the moment, there's a little bit of trial and error in, in, in these techniques. And I think what would be useful is to do the tutorials and see how we've set it up in the tutorials and get a bit of experience there and then talk with one of the demonstrators, uh, someone who's got some experience of extracting Vanier functions. And, and then I think that'll be a more, more productive uh, discussion once you've been able to see it. But I will say there's a little bit of trial and error in this, uh, in this process at the moment. Okay. Right, let me scroll through. So what would happen in this scenario? So when we have a, we're track, uh, trying to get a, um, a smaller number of Vanier functions than we have bands, we will start off by doing the minimization of the um, gauge invariant spread, the extraction of the optimally connected subspace. And this actually does have a tolerance on it. So we do tend to run this because it's a, we, we find that this, this converges, if everything is well, this converges uh, quite quickly. If things, if the windows aren't chosen right, we find that this converges very poorly. So this is actually quite a good uh, in, in indicator of things. Um, so, for example, this is um, a minimization of gauge of variant spread that took about 17 steps. Okay. 
Um, so just a reminder, so this is, this is my copper. Are the last three, no. <laughs> Whoever asked me, are the last three lines mandatory? I think they mean, can I go backwards in my talk? Maybe I can. Yes, I can. Um, do you have to specify the windows? No, these are not mandatory. Yeah, the user guide is actually really good. We're very, uh, well, I wouldn't say, but we're, we're, we're very clear on what you have to put in and what is, what is optional. Um, you'll normally end up specifying the windows because you'll find it useful, but you don't have to. Um, right, so that was that was that was copper. So that's the QE band structure. And just to say, this is what would have happened at the end of the, the minimization um, when we plot out the, um, uh, the the Vanier interpolated bands. So this was my frozen window down here. The Fermi energy is this line over here, and you see that all the states are well reproduced inside the inner window. That's the reason, the area in which they're physical, and then outside. Um, minimization of the gauge invariant spread has chosen the correct states that essentially carry on the character of the states that are down here. So for example, it ignores this state, maybe that's got some, some P-like character that isn't in our Vanier basis, and instead it's chosen a more kind of free electron-like state um, that goes up here and, uh, and down here. Okay, And th these are what the Vanier functions look like, five d orbitals and these two interstitial blobs. So that's a seven-dimensional uh, Vanier basis for, for copper. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do I believe the results? So in other words, have you done a good Vanierization is always the question. So what are you looking for? You're looking for the, 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 um, the spread. So if you're doing the, when you're, when you're doing the Vanierization part, um, the spread should have converged. Often, it, it, you know, in simple systems, it might converge to numerical precision. But once it's converged to less than 10 to the minus 5 EV, that's actually quite well converged. It certainly won't make a difference to any um, properties of the interpolated Hamiltonian. Um, you're looking for the individual Vanier function spreads to be small. That's a really rough, saying less than five uh, square angstroms is a really rough rule. It, it's, 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 it's hard to say that, but, it, but it, you, you're looking at quite a small number. Um, the Vanier functions themselves should be real, and you can do that by, by plotting them, at least in the absence of spin orbit coupling. Okay. Um, and you should look at the, uh, the interpolated bands. That's really the key thing to, to make a comparison of. Okay. Um, just to note quickly that there is the, as Arish mentioned, there's the post pressing tool, post Vanier 90. Um, you can run that in serial and parallel, and there are a variety of different uh, properties you can obtain. I focus more on how to get hold of the Vanier functions. And of course, there are lots of other tools that, that will run off the back of, off the back of Vanier 90. Okay. And perhaps just to finish, just to note a few, a few bits of uh, uh, places for, for support and advice beyond this workshop. Uh, the website, the user guide, we try to document the source code reasonably well. Um, and we do also have uh, the Vanier 90 mailing list. Okay. Right, that was my whistle stop tour of the, of the Vanier 90 code. I'll stop there and um, uh, take any questions if there are any. <clears throat> so I see there are, there are some questions online, but maybe let's see if there is. Okay, I see at least two questions in presence. Let's start from these. So the, the maximally localized when your function have an exponential tail, and as you probably know, the paper proving that is almost unreadable. So I, I can, now you have shown a very nice exponential plot about the, the effect of the image, uh, periodic images. Can that be taken as a computational proof that the tails are indeed exponential? I mm. I've always taken it to be as as such. It does seem to work out. What I was kind of pleased with as well is that 
the exponential decay happens for, you know, if you consider the valence bands in silicon, you get this exponential decay. But there, it's also true for Evo's dis, um, uh, disentangled Vanier functions. So if you form the Vanier functions in, in, in metallic systems um, with, with, with Evo's process for doing this disentanglement, and then you do the same, uh, look, at, look at the same convergence property, you still get the same exponential decay. And I think that's part, those, those Vanier functions may well be outside the kind of formal proofs. Okay, there was another questions, question up here. Uh, is it necessary that this ending, this entanglement criteria must be satisfied? I would say that it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. So um, one of the things you can play around with in the tutorial is, 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 is where you choose, for example, the top of the, um, uh, the, the, the windows. So how many states that you're including. Um, so, for example, so for example, here. So, for it, so in this in this particular case, if you put your window say there rather than here, what you might have found is that the um, that it didn't have the quite the right state to be able to get very well localized Vanier functions. So, what you might have found there is that the um, that minimization that we did for the disentanglement of the gauge invariant spread that might have either converged extremely slowly or quite poorly. Uh, or just not converged at all. Um, and then you find that if you look at the band structure and go, well, hang on, if I move my window a bit further up so I can include this extra state, then I've somehow got the right character within, that, within the set of bands which I'm choosing, and the minimization happens quite, no quite nicely. So, so my recommendation is that, that you should use the, um, that initial minimization as, as a guide as to how well you've chosen the windows of the, st of, of the states. I found a case uh, in which this entanglement criteria is satisfied, but uh, um, I was uh, getting uh, imaginary Hamiltonian part. But in the other case, where disentanglement was not satisfied, but real Hamiltonian part and imaginary is zero. So what should we believe? Like real Hamiltonian must be there. So the other case where disentanglement is not satisfied. I think that's quite specific, and I'd, I'd be kind of interested to see your input files and, and, and things and make a, I think it's very, I wouldn't want to make a very general statement uh, about that. I think I'd be just interested to see the files and then I can comment more specifically or any of the demonstrators can probably comment. And is it a good idea to increase the number of steps to minimize the spread? Yeah, so, so it will, I mean, the, the, the algorithms, particularly at fine k-point meshes, so one of my recommendations actually is to always start with a fairly crude k-point mesh when you're getting hold of the, the Vanier functions. It may well be that the interpolated bands are, are, are not very good, they display a lot of oscillation, but you'll find that the minimizations work much more uh, efficiently and they can find to the right minima. So I normally would start with a very crude k-point mesh in order to decide on what my Vanier function should be. When I seem to have got good Vanier functions with the right kind of properties, I'll then increase my, my initial ab initio mesh in order to get the interpolated properties that I want. I was talking about like number of iteration steps. Uh, yes, you sometimes need quite a lot. So we can increase it, so it means to minimize yeah. the spread. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And how many items we can deal with this Vanier 90? I think we have time. Yeah. There, is, there is an entire afternoon for, for technical uh, yeah. questions, I think. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, maybe, Jonathan, you, you can go through the questions that were asked online and see if there is anything you want to answer now or if you want to just, you know. I think I got a few, I think I got a few of them as, as, I, as I was going through. If I ignored any, apologies, but it was probably because I thought that would be better asked in the tutorial sessions. Um, Okay. Okay. So I yeah, think I, I think I can pick things up in the tutorial sessions. Okay. In the in <clears throat> so in the interest of time, I think we can stop here. We are a bit late on schedule. And thanks, Jonathan, for the great talk.